About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin, and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window, which led into the living room, and none with outside access. The window's going to be important for later. The apartment was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little bit later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet, and not someone I wanted to go out of my way to hang out with, but was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks after his move, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving he and I alone in the house for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things are normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I'm woken up at about 8 a.m. to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate, we'll call him Kyle, is standing there when I open up, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, So do you want to tell me what went on last night? To which I was shocked and confused, because I had come home from work at about 9 p.m., showered, and immediately went to bed. I explain this to him, and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room, that he saw me in the side alley out the window, arguing with our landlord, whom I'd never even met at that point, that he heard people coming in and out of our house all night. I tell him no way, none of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and doesn't bring it back up again. The next morning, I wake up to the same thing, this time he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend, but I was single at this time. He had seen me talking with our other roommate, who, mind you, was still in Hawaii, and asking me for the badge number of the officer I'd spoken to, since he'd apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry and more or less tell him to cut the shit out because I'm not doing anything and don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, will you call me an ambulance? He leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later. When I open up, Kyle repeats the exact same story verbatim. This happens once more before I tell him to leave me the fuck alone and ultimately leave for work. I go to work as normal. I'm reluctant to return that night but I'm too tired to switch to an alternate location. Big mistake. About 1 a.m., I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom, the living room, and out the front door, walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily and slamming the doors. I can see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he can't see inside. Suddenly, he screams, I can't live like this. Why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone, so I don't respond. A few moments later, he screams my name repeatedly, and I realize he's directing it towards me. I knew I had to get the hell out of there, so I very quietly creep out of my bed and start getting dressed and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done when he screams, I hear you, and charges over to my room, slapping the wall next to my door, but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ear against the glass. I was absolutely terrified and sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window, and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now. My shoes are kept on a rack outside my door, and not inside my room, so I know that when I leave, I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him out the front door again, at which time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He screams, 
Do you want to f***ing fight about this? Come out right now, and we'll fight, I swear to God. Now, I'm a very small, five-foot-tall girl, and this guy is easily three times my size, so I'm definitely not looking to fight. Thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close, followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement, and then decide to take my chances. I took a breath, pulled my door open quickly, step out and grab my shoes before I look up a second later, and see him standing shirtless, with just a pair of boxers and socks on, in the dark of the hallway. His arms slung slightly outward in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. That was a hard no for me. I grab my shoes and run out the door with them in hand. I make it about a half block barefoot before I stop to put them on. When I look back, he's standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run, but not moving. Luckily, I had a friend who lived two blocks away, and I had their spare key, so I let myself in and crashed there for the night. And that's where I stayed for the next week or so while we worked things out with the master tenant. Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened, or wasn't sure if it was real or not. But if I said that's what went down, then it must have gone down. The day Kyle left, he sends me a photo of the house key sitting on the table and says, I'm out, nothing else. I take a friend over there with me to scout it and ensure that he has actually left. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped all of the fire alarms out of the ceilings. He had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realized that my front door can only lock by using a key from the outside, and it had been locked when we arrived, meaning Kyle still had a key. We called the locksmith immediately. Even after changing the locks, I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards and never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day, I still fear for his safety. He was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age. My family and I lived out of town, about eight miles out. Our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off two blocks away from home every day. One afternoon, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me on the way home, so slow that I figured they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and walked directly home. That was the end of that day. Consistently though, this truck would follow slowly behind me after school. After a few days of this, I walked into my house, I was always the first one home, and looked out the window to see inside the cab was an older man and a black lab. He was staring at me, idling inside his truck, made sure to make eye contact with me before he pulled away. I decided that enough was enough. I told my parents that night, of course, my sister was quick to jump in that I was lying. I did have a habit of telling stories, but my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning, and sure as the sun rises, that red truck was there, across the street at the gas station, pointing directly at the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene. The man was disheveled and dirty hunched over in his seat just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't quite make them out. It freaked her out so much that she called the police and the school. I went to school and was quickly pulled into the office. The man had been spotted around the campus, waiting in his truck. That day I rode the bus home. This time, I found the truck was parked alongside the street. I would have to walk past this man's driver's side door to get home. I debated, considered running for it. Apparently this man was getting desperate now that he was spotted. The police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man. 
He quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. Never saw him again. And I don't believe that he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days, and children go missing all the time. I don't like to think about if I had been grabbed. I certainly wouldn't be here typing this. My kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky, and many children aren't. I honestly never thought that this would happen to me. Last night, I was doing some shopping alone at a local TJ Maxx. I, a 35-year-old female, rarely ever go shopping alone, especially in the evening. I usually have my kids or my husband in tow. I'm browsing around aimlessly, kind of just going all over the store, not sure what I'm going to get. I see this young guy, probably early 20s, skinny with glasses. Didn't think anything of it. I went to a different spot in the store. I see him again. He's in the same aisle, picking stuff up to look at, and then putting it back. No cart, no anything. My red flags were not raised just yet, but then I see him a third time in a different area, doing the same thing, but now stopping and texting someone intermittently. My senses start to perk up a little bit, like, okay, this is weird, but I'm not nervous yet per se, but I'm more aware. Then it happens again, and this time, I know that something is off. He's following me all over the store, and has nothing to buy. Nothing in his hand, no cart to speak of. So I start kind of zigzagging through the store. I find a coat that I want to try on. At this point, I was very wary, but also thinking I'm being ridiculous and paranoid. I just had the strong sense that this was not normal. I went into the dressing room for about 15 minutes, hoping that I would lose him. I came out, and I didn't see him for another 20-ish minutes. I was relieved, thinking I was definitely being paranoid, and that he most likely left. I go to the checkout after almost an hour and a half of shopping, with a cart full of stuff. I was the only one in line. I get called to cash out, and as I turn around, the same man is immediately behind me in the checkout. He came out of nowhere. He had a single item, some cheap little decoration. At this point, I was full on panicking. The cashier could tell I was being weird and was certainly distracted. At the risk of sounding crazy, I almost didn't say anything. But I told her that I think this man is following me. She was extremely empathetic and did not seem very surprised. She was like, I'm so sorry. I'll have someone walk you to your car. And I was so thankful for her kindness. The man checked out with his one item and left the store with an older man who I didn't see before. Older man had nothing that he bought. The parking lot at this store is a huge dark plaza. I didn't want to go outside alone. I just knew it was a bad idea. The cashier asked another employee to walk me out. This employee was younger than me, but so, so sweet. I apologized profusely because it was sleeting and cold rain, and she had no coat on. She said, I don't care if it's downpouring, I would still walk you to your car. It was an absolutely sweet sentiment. She walked me all the way, and even waited until I pulled out and drove away. This whole time I was shaking like a leaf. Like I said, I may have heard of this happening to so many other women, but I kind of thought they might be paranoid or exaggerating. This was extremely scary though. The more I think about it, the creepier it gets. He followed me around the entire store and everywhere I turned, there he was. I have no idea what his deal was, but this was absolutely unsettling. My husband freaked out and doesn't want me to shop alone anymore either. I don't really want to shop alone if I'm being honest. If I had not been paying attention or dismissed my bad feelings, something bad may have happened. As a woman, being aware of your surroundings is oh so important. So I encourage you all to be present, be aware of what's going on, and if you see something, ask for help. There's no telling what danger it could keep you out of. I 
about three years ago. I was 38 weeks pregnant. My husband and I lived in what we called our village. It was two dead-end streets off a highway with forests beyond the ends of the roads and a small local store at the corner of one street. We called it the village because our trailer park neighbors were my aunt, uncle and cousin's trailer, and then my husband's brother and nieces. Then my grandma's house was on the next street over. My other aunt, uncle and cousins lived with her at the time. My husband and I were about 21 years old then. My best friend Ray was visiting me from college and had spent the night with us. The next day, we decided to walk up my street, down the highway past the store, and then down my grandma's street and back through the woods to my house. This was to try to help get labor started as my pregnant belly was huge and my back hurt often. We were talking while I hobbled with her down the highway when a white truck rode by rather slowly. I knew the speed limit was 55 and this guy had to be going like 25 miles per hour. Through the driver's window, I saw a bald white man, maybe in his 50s, rubbernecking right at us. At this time, it looked like there might have been someone else in the passenger seat. The truck was kind of old, but I didn't know the year, make, model, or even see the plates. Ray was talking and unbothered until I said, Hey, that guy just went by really slowly. I don't think that was anyone I know. She replied with something like, Oh, I didn't even notice. We were halfway to the store, less than two minutes later, when we saw him coming back from the other direction. I said, that's him again. Get in the grass. Since we were on what would have been his right side, we went down the slope of grass off the road. We were still in front of people's houses because the section of highway is lined with residences between the dead end streets. He passes us slowly again, and when I turn to look behind us, he's slowing down even further as he finds a spot and starts to turn the truck around again. I told Ray to run, so we ran. I was doing the best I could being super pregnant. We thought about going to the store, but decided to head for my grandma's up the other street instead. Her house was up the hill at the end, but it wasn't a long run. When we got up the hill, I looked back again to see his truck pulling into the store parking lot. As we made it into my grandma's house, she and my aunt were sitting at the table, and we told them what had just happened. My aunt made a police report right away. I was afraid to at first thinking that maybe I was being paranoid. What if it was someone I knew, and they were just trying to say hi? Maybe it was all a waste of the police's time. Turns out there had been other reports of a man creeping around the neighborhoods. Someone in another trailer parked down the highway reported that her kids were outside playing when a man emerged from the woods trying to lure one of them in. The kids hollered for their mom, and as she came out, she threatened the man, so he ran off. It continues. A few more times we think we see his truck, but are not sure if it's him, since one of the other local residents also has a white truck. My family had yet to see the truck, so they couldn't identify it. At some point when I wasn't home, a few of my cousins were playing outside. Their ages ranged from 10 to 15. This time, the truck came rolling down our little street past them. He turned around at the end, came back up, and stopped right next to them. They said he was trying to lure my 11-year-old cousin to the truck, but he said no, and they all ran back into my aunt's house. We had talked with the children about what was going on in the neighborhood lately, so I think they had a good idea. One more thing happened before the report stopped. I had my baby at about 40 weeks. My husband, his friend, the baby, and I were all home. Baby was about a week old at this point. We got a call from my aunt at my grandma's house, that they had seen the man real up close and personal. My two female teen cousins were in their room. It was getting dark out, but for some reason my cousin went to open the blinds to the window, and there was the man, squatting on the AC unit staring at them. They screamed and he jumped off and ran into the woods behind the house. My aunt promptly called the police. My husband and his friends later went out with guns and flashlights to search for him, but didn't find a thing. I believe he was parking his truck somewhere and then stalking houses from the forest. My husband and I actually used to walk through those woods and never had any issues, as it was private land that we had permission to walk on. It also seems that this man did not have a preference for age 
or gender. He was looking for anyone he could get for whatever sick reason. Around this time, there had been police sent to patrol the highway and or sit on the side of the road waiting, keeping an eye out for him throughout those weeks. But they never caught him. I still wonder sometimes if he was someone from out of town and hope maybe somewhere he gets busted before something bad happens. But let's be real, we might never know. I'd like to tell you a story that my mother always repeats when we talk about creepy stuff. This happened to her about eight years ago, and according to her, this is the scariest thing that has happened to her in her life. Some context. My mother is a classic stay-at-home mom, and my dad a working man, so the old school stuff. My mother spent all her time taking care of my five siblings and myself, and our 60-pound hunting dog. That dog is a cutie, and most certainly does not look dangerous, unless she really wants to show it. A few times a week, my mother would drive the dog to the nearest forest. It was a spot where a handful of people would usually walk their dogs. Ours was an absolute energy machine, so the woods were a good place to power her out a bit. On an afternoon in autumn, my mother did just that. It was slightly chilly outside, but not too cold. My mother drove to the spot where the trail starts. Those who walk the same route usually park their cars in the same spot. The path through the forest runs circular and starts and ends back at the parking area, perfect for walking dogs. To her relief, there was only one other car there, which was perfect, because that meant that there weren't very many other dogs to whom our dog could be a bitch to. She really has no patience with other doggos. My mom and the canine walk the path for about 10 minutes. So far, they haven't seen a soul. It was a Monday afternoon, and seemingly those two were the only pair on the trail. When picking up the ball, which was dropped by our dog, my mother actually has to turn around because it rolled behind her. There, she sees a man wearing a long beige trench coat and woolly hat, about 30 some odd meters behind her, walking on the same path. She locked eyes with him, but no greetings or waves were exchanged. Now, there is nothing odd about people keeping their distance while walking, but what struck my mother was that this guy has no dog with him. Kind of abnormal for this trail, but maybe he was just in need of a hike. So my mother turns back towards the dog, who is eagerly waiting for her ball to be thrown. She continues walking down the path, and can still hear the footsteps of the man on the gravel, dirt, in the distance. Because they remain from the same distance, my mother doesn't turn around again. Don't want to creep the guy out, you know? Though my mother was feeling a bit uncomfortable herself. There's just something weird about somebody walking behind you, when you know they can see you, but you can't see them. After about five, maybe ten minutes more of walking, the sound of the man's footsteps on the gravel ceased to exist. My mother concludes that the guy must have left the trail at a recent crossing. She then decides to turn around out of curiosity. What she saw then was what set off the alarm bells. The man was not to be seen on the gravel path, but instead he was standing sideways behind a tree, right next to the path. This popped up several red flags for my mother, because it was super obvious that this was an attempt at hiding from her. From her angle, she could see a bit of his coat's shoulder and part of his leg. The man wasn't facing her. The way he was standing, he must have looked towards the trees on the other side of the gravel path. This way of standing sideways looked a lot like he was trying to make himself slim enough to be hidden behind a tree, and he was standing completely motionless. My mother began to be afraid. Something was up, because this just wasn't normal. She told me that at first she was thinking that this could be some weird flasher. We had some in the area a few years ago, a dude in a coat who would expose himself to women and children. But why would he hide like this then? That was my mother's next thought. Someone looking to commit an assault. That was her conclusion in her mind. Isolated woods, a woman alone with her cute dog, the sun was already beginning to set, and it was highly unlikely that somebody else would show up on the path shortly before darkness fell. She had to think quickly now. All I have to deter him is the dog. She might be big, 
but oblivious, and she's not much for attacking actual people. How do I utilize this dog to be scary? As smart as she is, my mom remembered the neighborhood cat, Max. This dickish cat used to shit in our yard and enjoyed taunting our dog. Because of that, my siblings and I often let the dog out and hyped her up by screaming, Find Max! Or, Where's Max? My mom did just that. In a frightened but aggressive tone, she asked our dog to go find Max. And that's when our dog went absolutely ballistic, fletching her teeth and all, and doing those quick little barks that dogs are only known to do when they're in full-on attack mode. She went from harmless looking and oblivious to a 60-pound predator who was seriously flipping around looking for that bitch cat. And thank God it worked. The trench coat creep turned to his left, jumped from behind the tree back on the gravel path, and ran back into the direction from which him and my mom originally came from. Full sprint. My mother didn't want to walk the same way back. She decided to continue hyping the dog up while running the rest of the trail until she reached the parking area. Once she reached her car, she was exhausted and powered fully on adrenaline. She knew that she just avoided a massive creeper. My dog was super happy. The doofus seemed pleased to have done her job of getting rid of Max the cat again. One thing my mother noticed in the parking area, the second car, which was there previously, was now gone, and only hers was left. She drove home relieved, but still kind of having to digest what had just happened. I remember how I was sitting on the couch with my dad when she came in. She was hyper as hell, and quickly told my dad what had happened. My father decided to get her into a car and drive straight to the police with her. On the way, he also stopped the car at the Forest Trail parking area, just to take a shallow look to see if this guy was near the area again, but no sight of him. They went to the police station and filed a report. At least they took it seriously. My mother gave a description of the man's face and clothing. Unfortunately, she did not memorize the license plate of the car, which was possibly his, and she was unsure of what the model and make were. The police sure as sh were concerned, though. There have been violent assaults in the area before, and there's still an unsolved murder to this day. But the perpetrators are always different. Apparently the forest and our city are positioned at an intensely used traveling hub because different highways and traveling roads concentrate in the area. The theory is that such creeps travel along those roads and look for different hunting grounds. We've never heard anything about this case again. Thankfully nothing happened to my mother. And the trusty dog, who delivered in a time of need, had a long and happy life with lots of cheese and meat snacks. She died while being surrounded by all my siblings and me seven years later, at the lovely age of 16. She was an amazing dog, and I hope she felt all the love that we had for her as a family. A few years ago, I exited a train onto the station platform late one night. I realized that the only other person there was a tall, thin man with a hood pulled up over his head, who stepped out of the train car behind me. I didn't like this one bit. I did not like the idea that he could sneak up on me. So rather than run ahead, because I knew that with my short, corgi legs, anyone could easily overtake me, I looked around the platform for places where I could brace myself against something if he tried to throw me onto the platform, like a trash can or a stairway. When I saw some benches ahead of me, I began to slow down, hoping that best case scenario, he'd walk past me, so I'd no longer have a potential serial killer attacking me from behind. Or worst case, I'd at least be emotionally prepared for whatever came next. He unfortunately slowed down as I slowed down, and when I realized he was unlikely to walk past me, I just stopped suddenly and did the, oh shit, did I lose my keys? Pat down, thinking I could force him to walk past. He walked until he was directly next to me, turned his head, and said, Are you smart? He did not ask. He said. His delivery was flat, no inflection. It sounded like a statement, far from a question. His face was expressionless. It made me think of the Japanese slip mouth ghost, who would ask if you thought she was pretty, and if you said yes, she'd kill you for lying. If you said no, well, she'd kill you for being such a rude asshole. 
the only way to wriggle out of possible death was to give a confusing answer. And while she stood there racking her brain, you could make your escape. I stared right back at this man and said, Huh? I made my eyes as wide and as vacant as possible. He scoffed and then repeated, Are you smart? I blinked and repeated, Huh? He got a little closer and said, You look smart. So, are you smart? I shrugged with my palms up. I literally made the confused emoji pose and squeaked a noise that sounded like Scooby-Doo. He abruptly turned and walked angrily away. I stood for a while watching him, and to keep that same safe walking distance behind him, I did my pocket pat down again, loudly slapping at my pant legs for a minute before I resumed walking slowly, distancing myself even more behind him. I made sure to keep him in my field of vision while I walked the rest of the way down the platform, up the stairs, through the station, up the stairs to the street, finally tearing my eyes away when I saw that my bus had arrived. I basically ran across the street, leapt inside, scanned my fare card, found a seat and sank down. I looked out the window, and to my horror he was walking alongside the bus. He slowed down as he got closer to where I was sitting, and when he was directly by my seat, he seemed to pause for a bit, but didn't look up, and just continued walking. I was tense the entire ride home, and even when I reached my stop, I was absolutely sure he was going to be waiting there. To this day, I'm haunted by the thought of what he'd have done if I'd answer yes, or even no to his question. I guess being haunted is a little bit better than ever finding out. So I'm obligated to tell you that this isn't my story. It's my aunt's, but it's still scary as f This all started in the fall of 1998. I don't remember much as I was eight years old at the time, but I do know what my aunt told me. And now that it's been so long, it's probably safe to tell this story. She and her ex, whom I called my uncle up until this point, lived in a small one bedroom apartment in a fairly nice area of town. There were definitely some more rough areas not far from there, but their complex was gated, and you needed a code to get in. Anyway, around early October, quite a few people, including my aunt, began reporting that they were seeing a suspicious man around the complex. He was caught looking into windows of people's apartments, and their cars as well as the storage areas, and management was able to confirm that he didn't live there. This all happened until around Halloween, when things really went off the rails. According to my uncle, he caught the man snooping around my aunt's car and decided then to confront him. And the man ran away, according to my uncle. When he ran, he dropped a bag that my uncle brought into their apartment. He wouldn't let my aunt open it, as he claimed that he was going to turn it into the police, which we had thought he had, as one day he no longer had the bag in his possession anymore. Months go by, and this man is still creeping around, but only near my aunt and uncle's apartment, cars, storage area, but nowhere else. My aunt had called the police many times, and by the time they'd show up, the man would always be gone. It's now January of 1999, and here's the part that I remember, as I was at my Nana's when this happened. My aunt called my grandpa in absolute hysterics, she caught the man with his face pressed on the glass of her bedroom window, watching her while my uncle was away on a work trip. When he realized he was caught in the act, he tried to break open her window and get inside. My grandpa grabbed his 45 and headed out to the car with my Nana and I following him, begging him the entire way to let the cops handle it, and if he was going to go anyway, to leave his gun at home. But he didn't. It took quite a few hours for my grandpa to finally return home, but when he did, this is what he told us. This man was in the apartment complex dealing drugs. My uncle stole a supply and refused to give it back or pay him for it. We later found out this was because he was using it himself, as well as selling. So that man was planning to kidnap my aunt, among other things, to get his money. 
And while I'd like to say that this is the thing that made her divorce him, that wouldn't be true. They unfortunately stayed married for another 10 years after this. What a relationship. I'll start my story by saying that I'm a 29-year-old female from a small town in northern Tennessee. The kind of town where everyone knows everyone. The kind where you have to drive 30 minutes to an hour to a job that pays a living wage. So when my dad started his new job about nine years ago, he found out he was working at the same place as a friend he knew growing up, Barry. I'll also tell you that I was bullied a lot growing up, so I took compliments as jokes mostly. So when I first met Barry, he would compliment me and tell me how pretty I was. I think I was 20 at the time. And I always thanked him for the kind words, though I didn't pay them much mind at the time. As time went on though, the compliments got more intense. He would say he'd love to be with a woman my size. I'd always do my best to laugh it off. I never said a thing. This went on at company picnics and holiday parties that I went to with my dad for about four years. Then I got a job with the same company, in the same department, as Barry. Things were okay for the three months that he trained me. He still complimented me daily, and I thanked him for the compliments. After my training, I went to the night shift, and only saw him for about 30 minutes of overlap per shift. Then seven months into the job, my boyfriend and I broke up. Barry was sympathetic at first, then he became a different person. His compliments became more focused on my body and not my face. He would stare at certain body parts while speaking to me and cock his head to the side while standing behind me if I had to bend down to pick something up. As a woman in a prominently male work environment, I was used to being stared at, but this, this was excessive. When I became single, he would also ask me about my sexual history, my preferences in the bedroom, if I'd be with a man of his age, early 50s, or a man of his size, about 5'5 five five and over 300 pounds. He'd become frustrated when I told him no. Declining everything he asked me never stopped him though. He just upped his game. He'd start talking about me and my body to other people at work and asking them questions about me or trying to get them to ask me the questions he wanted answers to. He did this numerous times to my best friend, who we'll call Jay for privacy reasons. Well, luckily for me, Jay just so happened to have a massive crush on me. He'd never do anything Barry asked of him, and he always told me everything Barry said or did. This continued on for around eight months, and then Barry came to the night shift. So my 30 minutes with him became a full eight hours. He would start telling me all about his sexual history, unprompted of course. The questions, comments, and staring never stopped. Just to give you an example, this man asked me if he won the lottery, would I sleep with him for money? I said no. He offered me a thousand dollars one time to have sex with him. I also said no, telling him that there is no amount of money in the world to make me sleep with him. He got mad at that. He'd ask for nude pictures, which I of course declined. He'd ask Jay to try to sleep with me and take pictures and videos, but he also said no. This all led to me constantly being stressed out, always looking over my shoulder to see if Barry was in my presence. I'm a very petite woman, and all my work clothes at the time were about two sizes too large. I did that on purpose so you couldn't see my body shape at all. I did that to try to make him stop staring. But it didn't matter. He still did. I stopped talking to him. I stopped being around him. But he continued. His comments were just to other people in the building. Mainly Jay. It came to a breaking point one week when my supervisor told me that my department had to work one weekend. Alone. Just Barry and myself on our shift. I begged him not to make me come in. I told him I would call out and take a point or whatever I had to do. I told him how scared I was to be alone with that man. I told him no man should be alone in a building this size, with a single woman, period. He listened and canceled the overtime. He made sure I was never alone with Barry without a third person around. 
I finally broke down and told HR about it all. That turned out to be a waste of time, though. It continued for six more months, but thankfully I was on medical leave for surgery for a few of those months. Then in November of last year, the right person on my shift heard me crying and complaining to Jay about everything before, and they complained to HR on my behalf. They finally opened an investigation. They asked me a ton of questions, and my answers filled up two notebook pages front and back of just the comments and questions from Barry over three years. They asked Jay a ton of questions as well, and a few other people who worked around us. Three days later, Barry was finally let go for harassment. He threatened me the day they put him on suspension for the investigation, and he was then banned from company property unless he wanted to be arrested. I filed a no-contact order against Barry and haven't heard from him in over a year. Jay finally told me that Barry had admitted to him at one point shortly before he was let go that if he ever got me alone, he was going to assault me, do ungodly things to me, and then just leave my body somewhere. So I'm extremely grateful to my supervisor for not letting that happen to me. I had to type all this out twice to get my thoughts in order. The thing that bothers me a lot is that Barry had a daughter a year younger than me, and she had nothing to do with him when I knew him. I can't help but wonder what abuse he possibly put her through growing up. It's been over a year since all this came to an end. I'm no longer scared at work. I'm not on edge or stressed out. I'm not living in baggy-ass clothes anymore. But as long as Barry is living and breathing in my hometown, I will not live there. He's made a lot of enemies in that small town because of this. That happens in a small town, when your parents know everyone, including the sheriff. Oh, and about Jay. His massive crush paid off, and we're now engaged. I've never felt safer with anyone in my life. So Barry, the pervert who made my work life hell for three years, let's never meet again. And to any other girl or woman who is being harassed at work, don't be afraid to speak up. I promise you, it's worth it to tell someone. I, a 27-year-old female, went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was a 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night, I camped at a gorgeous high-elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short, less than one-mile trail. So there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon at this point, and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy, I'll say mid-20s, walked by carrying a fishing pole and a small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came to say hi. I said hi and went back to reading, but without warning, he sat down on the stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy, amused tone, like, so you're just reading? Then he looked behind me, noticed my tent, and said, Oh, you're staying the night here alone? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it's obvious that I was. It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark and just drilling into me. I just responded with uh-huhs, or yep, or something along those lines, and tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks a beer, lights a cigarette, and just starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable, and I've stopped responding. Soon another hiker wandered by, and he strikes up a conversation with him. I take this opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend that I need to go get water. I went to the shore, filtered some water super slowly, and saw him walk away to go sit with a new guy, which made me super relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually, got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was just fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things when he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe a foot from my door. 
just looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but just started laughing really creepily, fakely again. I asked what, and his response was, just enjoying the sight, taking it all in. I felt literally sick to my stomach, and finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily strolled off. Later I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no cell service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and I remembered where he said he was from while talking to another hiker. I kept these things just in case. I also slept with my pocket knife close by. I debated leaving camp that night, but ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning in case he decided to come back. Now, normally while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle. And maybe this doesn't seem so bad when you're listening to it, but this was truly one of the most unsettling experiences I've ever had in the backcountry. I don't know where this guy came from, I don't know what made him want to strike up a conversation with me, but like I said, his vibe was completely off. I'm sure I'll be back out there soon, enjoying nature once again, but hopefully somewhere far, far away from this guy. This all began about a month ago, when a man started banging on my door at about 6 p.m., yelling for Mike to come out, that he needs to see him and get his cigarettes. But there's no Mike that lives here. I told the man that, that he had the wrong house, and that he needed to leave. But then he got even more aggressive, calling me a liar, and how he was going to come in and beat that skinny bitch you live with. I tried to call the non-emergency police line, but wouldn't you know, nobody picked up. Looking back now, it was stupid that I didn't just call 911, but it was instinct. And after some more yelling, the man just picks up and leaves. I called my father who was across town to come home, and I shared with him what had been going on when he showed up. He called 911 to file a report then. The guy came back and started screaming at my father. Cops were called once more, showed up an hour after the call, and couldn't find him. They told me to defend myself if it came to it. I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I just didn't feel safe at home. I can be a strong person, but I don't think I can do much against a drugged out man. What made that situation even scarier to me is that as I was going through my driveway camera photos, it shows him walking up to my house hours before, and I hadn't the slightest clue that he had been there. I have really bad anxiety, so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress. But I managed to finally calm down and convince myself that that was the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend, so I was left alone for a couple of days. I had just put on a scary movie when I heard that same screaming again, accompanied by a loud bang. I pull up my camera, and I see that the man is back, pacing back and forth on the sidewalk, and he's thrown over our trash can, once again, screaming for Mike. I call 911, and they show up within minutes this time, and are able to stop him down the street. They tell me there's nothing that can really be done, since he hasn't committed a crime, but if he comes back, to call again, and they'll have more than enough reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks. I again believed that that was the end of it. That is, until today. This morning, my father and I got into an argument, so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park, sat by a tree, watching cars pass every now and then. Just beautiful morning weather. I noticed a truck drive down the left side of the park and turn to the street my back is facing. The man driving the truck waved as he passed. So I did too, thinking it was just a man going to work. It seemed like a simple enough human interaction. This man then pulls off onto the right side of the park, stops, and makes a U-turn to come back. This is about the point where red flags go off in my head. So I get up and begin walking home. 
I look back and see that he's turned off his headlights and is now trailing me. I get to the front of my house and he slows down. I get a better look at his face this time and it looks like the man that was harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his red baseball cap, he just glared at me like I took everything in his life away from him. I get to the door and try to barge in, but my father had dead bolted the door out of anger of me walking out, so I had to yell to him that I was being followed and to open the door. By the time he opens it, the truck was gone down the street. I'm absolutely terrified to leave my home now. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike, but even now I'm scared to do that. I don't know who this man is or what his intentions were, but in the few hours since this has elapsed, I've seen him drive by my house several times. Same truck, slowing down to a crawl every time he passes. I've called the cops, but they've said that they can't arrest anybody for simply driving down a street. Not at this point, anyway. So now I'm left waiting, paranoid as to what this man's next move is. I'm not naive enough to think that this is over now. I know it's only a matter of time before he pops back up. Whatever's next, I don't know. A few weeks ago, I had to fly out to a small town I'd never been to in order to look for a place to live. I'm moving there in the fall to start grad school. My boyfriend flew with me, and before the trip, I researched all sorts of apartments on Craigslist and set up a bunch of appointments with landlords. Our first appointment was in the afternoon, in this sort of remote residential area. The landlord sounded fine over email and asked me to call him an hour before the appointment to confirm that I was coming. I called, but no answer. So my boyfriend and I started walking to the house and just hoped that he would show up. Maybe 10 minutes before the appointment, the landlord called me back. Are you coming? He asked. He sounded like an older man, had this strange, slow way of talking, but I just thought that he was old. Yeah, we're in front of the house now. He got extremely upset in an instant. We? Oh yeah, my boyfriend's with me. You never said you had a boyfriend. You never said that. It had never crossed my mind to have to tell him this information. Since my boyfriend would not be coming to live with me, he was just helping me look for apartments on the trip. I told the man so, and after a very long pause, he said, I I'm sorry, it's just, sometimes people don't tell me when they're married, and it surprises me. I'll see you soon. Then he hung up. I told my boyfriend about what the man had said, and he was immediately weirded out. He wanted to leave, but there were slim pickings in terms of real estate at this point, so I, stupidly, said that we had to stay, in case this place was the place. As we're discussing it, we see a man leave the house we're going to view. The man was young, extremely sketchy looking, greasy hair, furtive eyes. He took one look at us and ran out of the house to his car, pulled away from the curb with a screech. Okay, so now we're really weirded out, but this isn't enough for us to bail just yet. And as we look at each other wondering what to do, that's when the landlord arrives. He's in his 50s, maybe 60s, very tall, very strong looking. His eyes are completely blank and empty of warmth or emotion. He slowly walks up to us and says, I'd shake your hands, but mine are dirty. What from? Was the question my boyfriend asks. Work, was his flat reply. He asks us a lot of questions. Well, asks me a lot of questions, completely ignoring my boyfriend. The entire time he stares into my eyes without blinking. What am I going to school for? What other places am I considering for living? Is my boyfriend moving to this town too? I try to give answers that are as vague as possible. Meanwhile, my boyfriend asks the landlord questions of the same kind, which he plain refuses to answer. Then he says, apropos of nothing, let me show you the basement. At this point, I know that we should have noped out of there, but we didn't. 
I kept thinking that this was an eccentric old man from a small town. We're city folk after all. And that we were just feeling paranoid. My boyfriend, on the other hand, wanted out. But he followed us as the man led us to the back of the house. Away from the street. To this sort of detached shed. He opened the door, and we saw that there were stairs leading down into utter darkness. He flipped the switch at the top of the stairs, and the light didn't come on. Normally the response for this is, oh shit, the light's out, or something like that. But he just said, hmm, and slowly walked down into the darkness. Then he stood there, without moving, in the dark, and said, aren't you coming down? Well, there's nothing to see if the light's out says my boyfriend. The landlord just stands there for a long time, then slowly walks back up the stairs and closes the basement door without saying a word. He took us into the house. Weird and increasingly creepy things then ensued. The front door, which was the only exit to the house, locked automatically. And when my boyfriend tried to fiddle with it, the man got really upset and told him to leave it alone. He managed to get it open secretly, though. The man kept trying to box us into small rooms, and, according to my boyfriend, kept reaching his hands into his pockets, only to take them away when he caught us looking. On Craigslist and in person, the man claimed that there was a grad student already living in the house, but the evidence of that seemed arranged. There were neat piles of generic textbooks on the table, but no other things a 20-something might read. There was a bowl of fruit on the table, but no other food in the fridge or pantry, or utensils. There were maybe three t-shirts in the closet. This supposed grad student wasn't out of town, but the landlord couldn't say what school he went to, or how long he'd been renting the house. Finally, the man had showed us every single room in the house, save for one. This one he refused to open, claiming it was just the attic, and we didn't need to see anything up there. He gave us several reasons as to why when we inquired. It was unfinished. There was furniture up there. It would smell bad. The last one, I believed. Because standing near the door, it smelled absolutely terrible. Finally, we made our excuses and bolted out of there. The man walked us out, pretended to go to his car to leave. And when he thought we had turned the corner, he slowly sauntered back into the house. My boyfriend, fixated on the idea that there was something wrong with this guy, googled the man that night. We found out three things. That he was a pillar of the community, known by a lot of the townspeople. That there was no evidence of him owning or managing a real estate company, as he had claimed on Craigslist. And that he had listed his home address as the very house we had been touring. The house where the grad student lived. Still don't know what was going on there. Still don't know what to make of it, but this is one of the most chilling experiences I've ever had, on Craigslist, or in real life. I hope this story belongs here. I currently live in an RV, in my mom's driveway. My town is just larger than small, and it's relatively safe for all intents and purposes. Lots of rich people, doctors, lawyers live here, so it's kept very nice, and crime is relatively low. I never expected something to happen to me, but tonight, I met a man, and he was a reminder to me to always lock my door. Sometimes I forget to lock it, even while sleeping, and it's never been a big deal to me because my town is pretty safe, but I'll be locking my door every time I come in now. It was about 2 a.m. I took my garbage outside to the bin. When I turned around, I noticed a figure in the dark walking towards me. I started to quickly walk away. But then he spoke. He was a short man, probably in his 50s or 60s. I'm a 23-year-old female. He started talking to me about my living in the RV, and I took charge of the conversation to shut it down quickly. He told me what house he lived in and his name. He was being polite, but very creepy. I'm sure nearly every woman gets what I mean. That older man kind of creepy, and too polite 
because you're a pretty young woman. He told me I should come by his house sometime. And I'm like, mm, yeah, sure, maybe one day. Have a good night, though. And I walked back to my RV, locked the door. I figured that he would have left, but he didn't. I don't have a curtain on my window right now, and I could hear him pacing outside that window while mumbling to himself. I was just hiding, but I wanted to lock the door by my bed as well. It doesn't open at all, but I decided to lock it regardless. I got up and looked outside, and he was staring right at me. He was waving his hand at me to get my attention, walking right up to my window and acting so very erratic, pretty much a complete 180 from the man that I had just met. He watched me lock my door and window, and soon after that, he left my view. I felt like he was still there, though. Five or so minutes pass, and then he's knocking at my RV door. I don't know if he tried to get in or not. It's just a flip handle, so I wouldn't hear it or anything. I just waited there for what felt like an hour before I grabbed a knife and made the mad dash across the driveway to my mom's house. I'm definitely getting a taser and another level of personal protection. I think he'd been standing across the street watching me and there's no reason for him to have just been outside my RV at 2 a.m. I think he's been watching me for a while as well. People shouldn't really know that I live in the RV. Walking down the street, that's not something that I take notice of. I've only even started to pay attention to RVs and driveways since I began living in one, and I still don't notice if people actually are living in them or not. Maybe I'm being naive, but it makes me wonder if he's been watching me this whole time seeing that I live in the RV day after day. I don't go outside. I'm pretty much a homebody. So he'd have to have been staring into my RV to really even notice that someone was living in it. This terrifies me. I was so afraid of his intentions. He makes me realize that even though I'm in a safe town, I'm still a young woman. I'm a target on men's lists. It sucks this is our world. It sucks that there are men out there who are like this towards women. On June 3rd, 2016, there was a social media event that I attended. I was an Instagram influencer at the time, and the event was a golf tournament. I posted on social to ask followers to come, so when he showed up, it didn't surprise me. Sure, the tickets were 250 bucks a pop, but for some reason, that didn't click with me. It was a drinking event as well, and he showed up at least tipsy, but having a good time. He was also an Instagram model, who I knew insofar as our profiles followed each other. He asked me out on a date after the tournament. I was a single mom, and because of the event, my parents were watching the kid until the next day. So I said sure. We went off on the date, went to a bar, grabbed some food. The guy was handsome, and mostly charming as heck. We had a beer, and then in his car he offered me some weed. I rarely smoke but I decided what the heck. We hotboxed his ride, then went off to another bar. He was friendly with everyone and made me laugh quite a few times. Then off to the liquor store for more alcohol and finally to his house. I was drunk and high, so it was easy to sleep with me. He had a bunk bed and I remember him being on top, a very selfish lover, aggressive, and me being borderline scared. It was that inkling of fear that kept me from stopping him. He had driven, and my car was still at the golf tournament location, and I was too far away for me to afford an Uber to get back to my car. So the next morning, I went to the restroom, and afterwards I noticed a long pipe coming from the toilet after I had flushed. Once I finished in the bathroom, I asked him what the pipe was for, because I was generally confused and genuinely interested in what it was doing. That's when he became upset told me that it was to water the weed that he and his roommate were growing. I didn't know, or maybe I was still just a little out of it from the night before, so much so that it didn't click. I apologize for asking, but I was a little put off by the fact that that response really wasn't warranted from the single question I asked. We went downstairs, and this is the first time that I had a chance to look at the walls and the decor of the house. 
Knives and weapons were used as decorations all over. I understand that people have different tastes, but this fact was a little unsettling for me as well. I waited for him to have breakfast and drive me back to my car, trying not to outwardly show any panic. In the car ride back, I knew that I needed an excuse that wouldn't hurt his feelings. I told him I had a blast, and I'm so bummed because I really liked him. But my child's father passed away when he was one, which was true. And I can't have CPS take him away from me because I'm around someone growing weed. I told him that I personally didn't care about the weed, but also didn't want him to change. So unfortunately, this was where our story ended. I let him make out with me one last time as he dropped me off, although I was shaking as I drove off myself because of the general disconcerting vibes. The very next day, after he dropped me off, he met a girl that was 10 years our junior at a bar, pretty much an 18-year-old mini-me. He dated her for three weeks, she dumped him, and he stalked her like crazy. So much so that he was arrested a few times for his efforts. In September of that same year, he gets out of jail the last time and heads to a bar. He meets a girl there, takes her home. He ends up murdering her, chopping her body up, cutting her heart out, and ultimately setting it on fire. While no one's sure of the details of what led to this encounter, he was soon scooped up by the authorities, and the little information that we have trickled out to the media, and our nightly news had a field day with it. Currently, he's serving life for his crimes. I still get flashbacks of our encounter, and while sometimes I'm forced to relive the details of this occasion, I'm glad that I paid attention to all the red flags and knew when to leave well enough alone. I thoroughly believe that that's why I'm still here to tell this story in the first place. This happened more than a few years ago, but sometimes I still think about her. I, a 20-year-old female at the time, was earning my wage through college by performing in cabaret shows in semi-big cities. My parents helped out from time to time, but it wasn't enough to buy groceries and pay bills. Also, I don't really have a filter in what I tell people, just in case you're wondering why I told the woman anything at all. I was on a bus on my way to the train station to then take the train a few towns over for one such cabaret show. I was listening to music on my phone and had my earplugs in. When the bus stopped at my station, there was a middle-aged woman, I'd say maybe in her mid-fifties, immediately at the door outside to get in, and I felt her looking directly at me. It's okay, it happens. I have a clothing style that's unique enough to earn me looks from time to time. When the bus door opened, I got out, and the woman turned with me, tapping my shoulder. Let's call this woman Leslie since she told me her name, but I forgot everything except that it started with an L. The following conversation isn't word for word, but it is paraphrased to the best of my abilities. Leslie. Excuse me. Me? Yeah? As I take my earplugs out. Leslie. I just wanted to say, you have such a unique style, and it really stands out. I love it. You look like you're really creative. She was seemingly really genuine with this and I was pretty happy about the compliment. I didn't really think about the fact that Leslie was about to get onto the bus, but then didn't, as she was talking to me now. Me. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. And yeah, I earned my wage doing mm, this form of cabaret, so you're kind of right. It's unique. Leslie. Oh, that's so interesting. I gotta keep an eye out for the posters here in town then. Me. Yeah, I'm on stage here quite often. In a few months, I'll be at Club X, but tonight, I'm a few towns over at Club Y. Leslie. Oh, sounds like you're about to have a great evening then. Me. Yeah, I am. The people there are wonderful. Leslie. Then I'm coming with you. Now, hold on. Wasn't she just on the way somewhere? This was also when I realized that she didn't get onto the bus that I got off of, and that this bus had already driven off at this point. Me. Um, weren't you on your way somewhere? Leslie. Yeah, I was. To my friend's birthday. But I'll cancel. This sounds way more fun. Now, hold on once again. 
she had some place to be, and just randomly decided to cancel her plans and come with me. Onto the train, with a person less than half her age, driving three towns over, where, by the way, there was no way for her to come home afterwards. I had a place to sleep there for the night, but she wouldn't. Me. You won't be able to get back home afterwards. There's no train that late at night, and I'm only staying out there because I have a friend that lives there. Leslie's silent. She looked as if she started thinking, and I thought that she changed her mind for a split second. But then she smiled. Leslie. It's fine. I, um, I have a son living there. I don't remember exactly what she said there anymore, but I know that it was something to that effect, and that I immediately thought she was lying. At this point, I was beyond weirded out, but still not quite freaking. I started walking off, since I had to get to the subway still. Leslie took this as a sign of me agreeing, and came right along. I remember her talking the whole way to the subway, and that she was walking pretty slowly. I didn't have to rush to the station, I was pretty early in fact, wanting to grab dinner on the way, which I mentally wrote off at this point. But the way she held me back was by linking arms with me, and holding on tight. Now I'm freaking out, but trying my hardest to remain calm. Whenever I was asked a question about myself, I was lying now. In my head, I was making plans to say I wanted to grab lunch, sitting her down at McDonald's, and making a break for it. But Leslie beat me to an opportunity to bail. Sitting at the subway station, there was a pretty well-known homeless person of our town. We had never talked, but I knew his face, and he had always been polite to me. Leslie, apparently, did know him, and got distracted immediately, letting go of my arm. Leslie. Oh, hey, John. How are you? You doing good? John. Um, hi. I'm doing my best, but stuff is pretty shit at the moment. Leslie. Oh, you always say that. It's like I always tell you. You gotta... I didn't stay around to hear the conversation, and I began jogging off, then running, attempting to make my break for it. I didn't want to stop for dinner anymore. I was afraid that Leslie would find me again, so I immediately ran inside the train. It would be driving off in 15 minutes, which freaked me out even more since she would still have plenty of time to get inside and potentially find me again. So I did what I thought was best and hid in the train toilet until it pulled off. Then. And only then, I got out and found a seat. I had to change trains once, and felt watched the entire time. But Leslie, she was gone. She didn't appear in the next town, or at the cabaret show. I told the story to a colleague, and called my best friend, who helped to call me down. I never saw that Leslie again, and today I think she might have just been lonely, or confused, but at that time, I just knew that I didn't care to find out. Leslie, if you are out there, I hope that you're doing well and you have plenty of friends and a warm roof over your head. But I must say, I certainly hope we never meet again. I wanna share with you the story of why I'll never be able to look at my first tattoo the same way ever again. When I was 16 years old, my best friend and I made the dumb decision to get matching tattoos from an older man who was doing tattoos illegally out of his home. He was well known in the area within our age group for giving cheap tattoos to minors. He had recently gotten out of prison for giving minors tattoos and not practicing under state guidelines. Needless to say, I don't know what the f we were thinking. But hey, when you're a rebellious 16 year old, dumb as hell, and have the chance to get a tattoo for $20? I guess any and all common sense flies right out the window. So we set up a time with him to go over to get our tats. I don't remember the exact time we went there, but I remember it was already dark, so it must have been late in the evening. It was just the three of us alone in his house. I remember feeling very eerie being there. Something about him and the energy of the place felt just off. But being the dumb teen I was, I chose to ignore those feelings and just go through with it anyway. We were there for about half an hour, 
got our tattoos, and then left. Fast forward a few months later, I see the man's picture and his name on the news. At first I thought he got busted again for his illegal tattooing business. Little did I know that it was so much worse than that. He had been arrested for one of the most heinous crimes that I'd ever heard of and that I believed that anyone could commit. Turns out, he bought an old police car, a cop costume, handcuffs, and he would go into the rougher parts of Portland that sex workers frequented, impersonating a cop to arrest them. He brought them back to his house and chained up the victims in his garage where he knew that they wouldn't be heard. There, he repeatedly and viciously assaulted and tortured them. I was absolutely sick to my stomach when I found this out. I cannot imagine what these women went through and I still don't really know or want to know all the details. This was all happening around the same time we were at his house, so the chances that one of the victims were there is an absolute possibility. I thank God that nothing happened to us, but there's also a part of me that feels extreme guilt. What if someone was screaming for help while we were there and we just couldn't hear them? I'm forced to wonder why he didn't kidnap us. We would have been the perfect targets. Every time I look at the tattoo, it's a horrible reminder of what could have been, so I'm planning on getting it covered up. Thankfully, all of his victims are alive, and I hope and pray that they're able to recover from this horrible act. He'll be in prison for a long time without the possibility of parole. Always trust your gut. Try not to put yourself in sketchy situations. And when you're a 16-year-old that wants a tattoo, it might be worth waiting. Stay safe, my friends.